Um, who do we have that's new today? Who's new? A couple. Can we pass the mic and just have you introduce your name, state, role real quick? We're so happy you're here. We know you worked really hard. <laughs> And that's been wonderful, by the way. Um, I'm Heather Campbell Schock. I'm LSDA coordinator for West Virginia. Thank you. Um, beside being the LSDA quarter, coordinator, I'm the chief financial officer. Awesome. Hi, I'm Jessica Steins, and I'm with the Louisiana State Library. Uh, I'm the associate state librarian. I'm over. Um, library development, I'm here for our LSDA coordinator, uh, but I am so happy to finally be here, so thank you. As are I, we. I never thought I was leaving the Atlanta <laughs> airport. <laughs> Welcome. We had one more. No? Okay. All right, well, welcome back. Welcome, and welcome to all the virtual attendees, again, who are on with us today. Um, again, be thinking on your burning question for the end of this day's activities. This is a question you're going to bring to your peers to crowdsource. And in that vein, I'm going to turn to the parking lot now, which is questions that we thought either we could answer or we could punt to burning questions or maybe just some observations that didn't make it in yesterday. So start like this. All right, so one question came in that we can't answer. When can, when can the SPR data be exported by users into a CVS or XLS file? And by user, I mean SLA users. Um, and that's a question we're working with developers on right now. So I don't know the time horizon, but we want to make sure that there's an exportable data file that you can grab, much like right now only we can grab it. So if you do need your SPR data, just get in touch with your program officer for the time being and we will get it for you. Um, there is a public view export. As some of you know, it doesn't include budget data and there's some kind of gobbledygook in there that we're trying to clean up as well. It's been haunting us for years. So it's not the most reliable data set, but we are working on one that will be good and accessible to you. Another question came in, and I hope I answered this one right. I'm going to defer to my people. Uh, does a subawardee have to have an active SAM registration, or is having a UEI enough with, say, a lapsed or an active registration? And I believe the answer to this is subawardees don't need the full SAM registrations. You need the full SAM registrations as our pass through entities. But there's a way to get kind of just a UEI through SAM that's like a lesser level of registration in SAM. I'm seeing nodding, so I'm feeling good. They still will need to, re to renew it every year. And they still need to renew it every year, Madison clarifies. So I hope that answers that question. So yeah, if they've got a full SAM registration hanging out with a lapsed date, that's sort of a secondary consideration, I think. Okay. Uh, let's see what else is on. So these two I thought might be good for burning questions if the authors of them want to repurpose it for that. But I'll shout it out here. So the topic is digital connectivity or hotspots um, funds after ARPA runs out. So you know, what is the answer to that question? We know that NTIA has a lot of funding. Maybe our director will even talk a little bit about that. But um, some of you know where those sources of funding are or have creative ideas around that, too. And then another topic, effectively communicating to states that large influxes of funds may be over. Again, I'm not sure we're the end-all, be-all of answers to that question, but you guys can crowdsource that and figure out how to message. Then we had some observations. So one was um, kind of related to the ARPA session that Matt and I ran yesterday. For any future special federal funds, it would be helpful to A, have more time to spend it, and B, have timelines align with other similar federal programs. ARPA is an example. Subgrantees and others were so confused about the short turnaround for IMLS ARPA versus the other ARPA funds, and we hear you loud and clear. 
Okay. Uh, another observation, promotion, promotion, promotion. Our biggest problem is that people are not aware of what libraries do. It seems like something we can help with. Could not agree with you more. Almost done. Okay, here's, a, here's one I haven't even read yet. Uh, the crisis of so many new directors. How to bring them on board with LSTA funds? Great burning question. I'm gonna defer that one. And then an observation from New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, we cannot use the phrase white supremacist culture due to North uh, New Hampshire law and public employees can be reported or dismissed. So what other phrases can be used was the question. And then a side note, there's a reporting portal for public employee violations of this such law. So URL here if you're interested. <laughs> Thanks, Lori, and sorry. All right, so the, we took care of parking lot. Um, we took care of most of the announcements. I'll look to my, my colleagues. Do we have any, any virtual um, things that we need to, we're good? Okay. We got Cindy and Laura again on the virtual front over there. Thank you. So at this point, we were doing the reflections. I am so pleased that we have our director, Crosby Kemper, here with us. Um, he's going to talk to us about what he sees from his perch as our IMLS director. And for those of us who've had the honor with wor of working with Crosby during this pandemic, I mean, he's basically come in as our pandemic director and he has risen to the occasion. I don't know how we would have done this without someone as um, good of a leader as Crosby. He's led us with humor and with motivation and vision and just everything you would want. And I think that's probably evident from your view, but if you haven't had the pleasure of hearing Crosby before, you're gonna uh, get to hear him today. He's one of the most gifted extemporaneous speakers I've ever met. And so we don't have any slides for him, but don't worry, because it's, it's gonna be great. So with that, yeah, actually, I'm going back. Come on up, Crosby. Okay, great. Yeah, which I don't need, you know, because I have nothing to click. I'm, you know, I've managed to do this. Sorry about this uh, organizational dysfunction. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fairly extemporaneous. Actually, this is the first time I've ever tried to uh, to do a speech from my iPhone. So we'll we'll see how that how that goes. I do uh, uh, want to say to the uh, folks who are remote that I'm so sorry that you uh, missed the State Library uh, water skiing challenge uh, in, in Harbor Place, in the harbor. Um, and it was pretty, pretty amazing. I just want, there, there will be video. Um, uh, I, I wanted to start actually with, um, so I will start with uh, a, a press release we're gonna do, I think, next week. We, it was approved this week. It's the kind of thing that I've been working on in our world for a long time, and most of you have been working on too. Um, and it is uh, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman uh, Rosenworcel uh, of the FCC, uh, and I will have a joint uh, press release. Uh, and uh, you know, she's she's headlining the uh, the opening of the uh, <clears throat> uh, of the ALA today. And uh, uh, what, what we are going to say is that we are working together to do uh, better in terms of uh, getting money uh, to you, uh, to money to states, money to uh, libraries uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in your states. Um, and, I, you know, that sounds pretty bland, doesn't it? Um, and, uh, but I think those of you, I think everybody in this room actually knows, and I headlined my quote, which I was sure they were gonna edit, and they slightly edited it because it sounded a little bit like the FCC, this was the FCC's money and they wanted to say, no, really, it's the, uh, it's the money from the uh, Universal Service uh, Fund. Um, but I, I started out by saying, 
like the E-rate program, we need to, everything that federal government does needs to be focused on equity, and that means we need to simplify the application process so that the people who really need to get the money can, can do that. I think everybody in this room knows that you probably have either on your staff or you have consultants that you refer to or the libraries that you're working with have to have consultants to even apply for the E-rate program historically. They've simplified it some every year. We work with them to simplify it. There are little bits, go, you know, and it's kind of two steps forward, one step backward, or one step forward and two steps backwards. Um, so the fact that I, I I implicitly criticized the FCC in my joint statement with Chair, Chairwoman Rosenworcel. I take as a very big step in the right direction. They sort of get it uh, uh, in Washington now uh, that uh, that if we're talking about equity, and, and you know, I'm a Trump appointee, but all all power to the Biden administration fo for focusing on the word equity. Within the Biden administration, I want you to know that I focus on the practical aspects of equity. What does equity really mean on the ground? And in broadband, that means getting, number one, yes, connectivity, universal connectivity. We're about to spend, and I say about because we still haven't spent most of it, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, $100 billion. And when I was chair of Shelby, some of you were involved with Shelby, and uh, when I was chair of Shelby, if they'd asked John Windhausen and me, which they did periodically, how much money are we talking about to really get to 100% connectivity, we probably would have said something like $100 billion. Well, now we've got the $100 billion. So A, let's hope that we spend it well. Um, I was talking to Kelvin Watson, who is now the, the uh, uh, Las Vegas director, and, and he went through the, the, uh, the 120 million that he could spend to connect everybody in, in Las Vegas in his, in his district. And I thought, okay, I could sort of add that all up. Whoops, 100 billion won't do it. Um, but it comes close, close enough if we spend it correctly. So that's the big question, we're gonna spend it correctly. And part of my, my quote and the reason we're doing this and promoting education programs, some of this is about webinars with you guys. Um, uh, and and bringing, bringing everybody to the table to learn about how to do this and where the money is. And some of it's about the digital equity plans, which you all need to be involved in. Some of you are, all of you need to be involved in. That $42 billion uh, in, uh, in money that's gone to the states for infrastructure, for broadband infrastructure, you need to be at the table for that, right? And I know all, all of you essentially know that, but I, Every speech I give, I, every, every contact I have, I reemphasize that. You need to be at the table. We had a conversation about 10 days ago with Alan Davidson, who's the new head of the NTIA. That came up in question. Um, so let, let, me, let me say this. Um, had I really gone after them in the quote, the NTIA and the FCC, I would have, I would have pointed out the following. Um, we have a big... And, and some of you have, and I would encourage all of you to have a good relationship with tribal uh, institutions uh, in your states. Um, we have specific programs for the, for the tribal uh, libraries and cultural uh, organizations. Um, and, and the NTIA got a billion dollars, none of it came to us, of course, a billion dollars in the first tranche. There's more. In the first tranche, a billion dollars, 960 million uh, for uh, uh, for tribes, and as of about three weeks ago, I haven't updated these numbers, but before I was able to use these numbers with Alan Davidson, um, they, they had, of that uh, amount of money, they had, they had not obligated uh, all of it by any means. They had spent, they had gotten out the door a total of $18 million three weeks ago. As of today, I think it's in the 30, 30 plus million. Um, and it, there was a question about spending rates and you know, our mandate for spending the ARPA money, the CARES Act money, uh, uh, quickly. One of, the, one of the reasons that we, that the Congress likes us and that we are gonna survive, and I'll get to that in a minute, we're gonna su survive the budget cycle uh, over the next year, um, is that we have obligated, I think, Terry will correct me if I'm wrong about this, something like 99% of our money um, and, and we, when I say we, I now include all of you, have spent a good part of that money. One of the debates, and we're fortunate that it hasn't, you know, that we, 
we have this week uh, gotten a preliminary look at, at the budget for next year. Uh-oh, there's, there's the president again. Um, uh, uh, the, sorry. The, uh, we've gotten a look at the, the, the budget, and it looks like we're going to get a modest increase. That's, that's what's on the table right now. Sorry, he's persistent, you know, I will say that, but, you know, uh, when he's awake. Um, it, it looks pretty good. Um, one of the reasons that Congress is fairly friendly to us is that we do actually spend the money. You do actually spend the money. The debate that's going to be held, and you'll see that it's interesting that that hasn't been a huge debate yet, and, and that's good news for us, because the bigger it gets and the closer we get to November, the more likely it is that uh, Republicans will use this and, and, and make the budget a real issue, which they haven't yet. Uh, and that is a huge amount of the money from the, the infrastructure bill, from ARPA, from, uh, uh, from the basic budget uh, for, for last year and this year has not been spent. They're, they're huge, there he goes again, uh, there's a huge amount uh, of money floating around out there, and in various aspects of the federal budget, th that's what the debate was about uh, w when, when they were talking about the money for Ukraine versus other money, et cetera. It was all about what was un unspent. Um, and so I just want, as an answer to that earlier question, but also as a basic uh, uh, focus for us in the IMLS, we hope that you are capable of spending and, and are focused on spending the money fairly quickly when we get it to you. Um, that They notice that uh, uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, so uh, broadband is, uh, remains a very important subject and it, and it is all about equity. And a, l a large part of what I have to say today is in defining uh, equity at a practical level and, and our definition essentially is your definition, or another way of putting it is your definition is our definition. But I encourage you uh, in the money, when you get the LSTA money out, when you, when you are making those, those grants, look for real impact in, in the community. An awful lot of what we see, a lot of the grant proposals that we see for our discretionary money on both sides of the aisle, both the library and the museum side, um, in, in the DEIA universe, for instance, is what I, refer to, I'll deny this outside of this room, but as, uh, as navel-gazing, as very internally focused. Um, part, of, part of my emotional involvement this morning is stuff that I read last night from, uh, that came from Kansas City. As you, most of you know I was the Kansas City uh, director. Robin, are you here? Is Robin here? Um, uh, and uh, there were two stories that, uh, that people sent to me last night. Uh, one, one was uh, about the uh, 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 failure to pass a budget in the Mid-Continent Library because six of the 12 uh, trustees uh, objected to the DEIA work that the library was doing, um, and so they wouldn't pass a budget. Uh, and, uh, and then the Kansas City Public Library, got a, I got an email about a board, a board policy where they were doing DEIA work in which there, there was a lot of verbiage about dominant cultures and white supremacy and stuff like that. And I said, oh, okay, well, that, that's gonna be fun for them. Uh, and and, and I, lo I look at this world, I look at both sides of this world and I say, could we please be concentrated on, on doing the right thing, which is to help the people who need help in this country, uh, to, to help the people who are on, on the side of all of our divides in this country, and some of that is race, and some of that is poverty, a lot of that is education, and where we can work on that, in the library world where we can work on that is in terms of education, it is in terms of the digital divide and the digital connectivity, um, it's in terms of skill development, uh, the, pretty much every larger library and many small libraries and many rural libraries uh, in, in, uh, in this country are now focused on skill development, on helping, uh, helping kids develop sc uh, skills for the computer age, and helping with the basic equity. Uh, our, our library convening uh, was substantially about this that we did three months ago uh, in D.C., and, and that's reading. You know, we don't teach reading in libraries. But we, we are a major part of the ecosystem of learning, a major part of the ecosystem of reading. Our summer reading programs, uh, our, uh, our story times, our, 
pretty much everything a youth librarian does, uh, children's librarian does, is oriented towards the reading universe, uh, that, that engaging the, the child in the cultural richness of reading. Uh, and we know that's the basic skill, and we know it's one of the biggest divides in this country, and it's one that we can do something about. And, and if it's something we can do something about, instead of the internal DEIA work, I will, I will say a major, a major figure in the museum and library world, and I had this debate a little in his office in the castle, that will tell you who he is, but um, a castle, the Smithsonian Castle, uh, two days ago. Um, I, I believe there are practical things that we can do every day in our libraries and that you can do in supporting libraries, and particularly smaller, uh, and rural libraries in our country uh, that help people cross those divides. And that's what we need to be work on, working on. That's the real equity work uh, uh, of, uh, of the library world uh, and uh, of this country. Um, So I want to talk a little bit too about polarization and that you know what what these things I got from Kansas City uh, focus me a little bit on that. Um, I, you know, banned books are a subject, um, and uh, we, we all have to be devoted at, to the extent that we can be uh, with freedom to read, uh, with the ALA's uh, statement of uh, of values. Uh, and I think that's very important, and we can't get caught up on either side of the cancel culture on, on one side and the banned book culture that's, that's coming at us from, from the culture wars on the other side. There are problems on both the left and the right that libraries are, uh, are confronting. And the first thing I'm gonna say, and it'll be the last thing that I say to you today, is, is uh, something that actually Deborah Caldwell Stone said at the PLA. Uh, and, and I've known Deborah for a while, and uh, I don't always uh, agree with her, um, but I do absolutely agree with her about this. At the moment, the most important thing we can do in terms of the freedom to read and, and, uh, and the, the, the attacks from both sides, uh, uh, the cancel culture that's coming from both sides now, is to know our communities, to be involved in our communities, to understand our communities. What, what's going to be on, the, on our shelves and what kind of programming we're going to do is going to be different in San Francisco than it is in San Antonio. Um, it's going to be different in the, in, the, in the various Springfields around the country, Springfield, Missouri, or Springfield, Illinois, or Springfield, Massachusetts. It's going to be a little bit different in every city. And, and, and it's going to be different because you are working for and doing things for and with your communities. Um, and, and our state libraries need to be engaged in that activity, which is to say understanding the community and working with the community. Um, that's the only way that there's going to be a good outcome uh, out of what's uh, going on. Uh, and uh, I, when, I, when I came to Washington, there was only one uh, you know, political question that I was asked to, to answer. I met with Democratic staffers and Republican staffers and a number of members of Congress. Um, and the only really tough question I got uh, was a, a member of Senator Hawley's staff uh, who asked me my position on drag, uh, drag queen uh, story time. And I said, well, I don't really have a position on drag queen story time, but I will tell you this, we don't do it in the Kansas City Public Library, but I know the St. Louis Public Library has done it. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I said to him, I, I think it's different in different cities. Again, in San Francisco, you almost expect drag queen story time, right? Um, in, in a lot of places in rural Missouri, um, if you did drag queen story time, it would, it would be seen in the community as an assault on the community. And you have to know your community is the, is the bottom line uh, that I, I want to say to you. And I, I, I don't... I, 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 don't, I still don't take a position on drag queen story time. I take a position on knowing your community. Uh, we're also doing work, and I hope to involve uh, all of you uh, in, in this work uh, on America 250. 
Uh, America 250 is the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 2026. There's already a commission, a commission that, like about everything else in the United States, has got lots of controversy uh, going on right now. Um, <laughs> um, it was just announced yesterday that uh, uh, they, they were dependent on Facebook, which they initially had not published. Um, that should have been a lesson right there, that they were afraid to publish the fact that their major funder uh, for the private part of uh, America 250 uh, was Facebook. $10 million Facebook was going to give them, and uh, the Wall Street Journal blew the whistle on, on that. It was virtually all of their private funding up to, uh, up to the point that Wall Street Journal started writing about this. Um, and now, yesterday, Facebook, uh, because of the bad publicity about this, withdrew its sponsorship of the America 250 Commission, which I'm on ex officio as the head of the NEH and the NEAR, too. Um, so it's kind of, we're kind of back to square one, which means the work that we do, the NEA, the NEH, and the, uh, the IMLS will be all that much more important, and Congress will be looking to us to, to help straighten things out. And so here's what, what I hope we do. I, I hope we address the problems in, in this country by doing uh, civil discussions and debates, civil discourse in our libraries uh, around the issues uh, issues that stem originally from the founding, slavery obviously, and, 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 and its long-term effects is, uh, uh, is part of that, immigration, whatever, whatever the issue in your community might be, uh, we need to sponsor through libraries and museums civil conversation, civil discourse uh, on these issues. That's the overarching idea. Uh, but within that idea, there is, is something I hope that, uh, that you all will endorse and, and partner with us on, uh, and that is this. We have a, a good relationship. We've always had a good relationship with the U.S. Customs and Immigration. We've always had a memorandum of understanding about uh, working on citizenship uh, education, uh, uh, English as a second language, the citizenship test itself. Um, and uh, as, as some of you know, you have libraries in, in your communities uh, that do uh, the citizenship uh, oath-taking ceremony, the naturalization ceremony. Um, and we want to highlight that uh, going into America 250, engage more libraries and, and more communities uh, in, in that as public uh, a, a practice. Uh, and, and one specific part of this, I think we will make uh, uh, a, a programmatic response to the library world if we can and if you all are in agreement with it. Uh, and that is this. The citizen, you have to take a citizenship exam, which is an exam about the history and culture and government of this country. Uh, you, you have to, you spend time, you spend money, uh, a long time becoming a citizen uh, if you're an immigrant. Uh, and, and then you have to take this test and you have to pass it. And surveys have shown that 70% of adult native-born Americans cannot pass that test, right? Most of us graduate from high school or graduate even from college not knowing uh, the, the information, and, and which tells, by the way, you know, January 6th is partly a result of people not understanding the Constitution, not knowing what the Constitution really stands for. Um, so making making this uh, a contest, in essence, to see you know, libraries and museums. This is Alberto Barguin's idea, actually, who's the head of the Knight Foundation. We were talking about the citizenship test, and he said, why don't you make it a contest between muse museums and libraries around the country to see who can get the highest percentage of their patrons to pass the citizenship test. So I think we're gonna work on something like that. We're gonna stress citizenship and what it means and the understanding, the education you need to have to be a good citizen uh, in this country, and, and also work through civil discourse uh, on, on that. So uh, that's America 250 and, and, and something that will be promoted by the IMLS over the next four years. Um, uh, the other thing that we have that's relatively new that I want to simply mention to you all uh, and uh, and, and hope that you'll work with us on, on this as well. And this is developing. You won't see anything directly from us for a little while. We're, we're putting, putting it together. But in our budget this year, and we're, we're already in, there's in, there are indications that we will get uh, more in, in next year's budget. We have budget for uh, an information literacy task force. 
And I'm sure all of you are engaged at some level, um, and it's part of our polarization, and some, some also relates to the banned books issue. Um, the information and disinformation uh, is rife in our country. Daniel Patrick Moynihan once uh, famously said, you have a right to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. In this country today, we seem to have confused our opinions with the facts. Uh, and w we've been asked by Congress, and this is uh, Senator Reid's idea, but he's been talking to us, we've been talking to him about it for a while, um, uh, is that at the local level, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of research and a lot of good thought that shows that we overcome the polarization uh, at the local level face to face. Um, local level activities um, are the place where we can do something about uh, misinformation and disinformation. And the best single example of that uh, recently revealed in a New York Times article, June 9th, uh, David Leonhardt, uh, his morning article, uh, and, and that is this. We all know, and this also relates to equity in a big way, and what we can do about equity, real equity in this country. So at the beginning of the pandemic, it was obvious the following was going to happen and did happen, particularly in the first year of the pandemic. And that is, People on the other sides of our divides, minority communities, uh, communities in poverty, were affected much more deeply by the pandemic than, let's just say, the middle class and upper middle class white community. We know that, right? But here's a factoid for you, an incredible fact. Uh, over the last year, the Hispanic community and the African American community have done much better in terms of I mean, much better in terms of death rates and, and even infection rates and hospitalization rates than the white community. Over the last year, there's a 72% gap between the white death rate and uh, the Hispanic death, death rate, a uh, smaller gap, but a similar gap uh, with African Americans. Now, that's an extraordinary, extraordinary number. Now, it's still true in the in, the entire, through the entire pandemic that there's a disparity in the other direction. But we have done something about that disparity in the last year, something really significant. And what Leonhardt suggests in his article, which I think is exactly true, exactly true, is that it is the local information ecology, the local information resources, where local healthcare authorities, uh, libraries, school districts, uh, municipalities, uh, working with neighborhood and community organizations, uh, uh, got the word out, um, created local clinics, local, local options for, uh, uh, for vaccination, um, and, uh, et cetera. It's really about vaccination, I think, more than anything else uh, that made this happen. Um, I think of, we gave a national medal uh, this past year uh, to the Highwood Public Library, small community of 5,000 people, primarily immigrant, Hispanics, 50% English uh, as a second uh, language uh, community. And Carmen Patlin, with a tiny budget, $400,000 budget, she raised this money, she partnered with Walgreens, and the, the 5,000 people in her community, in the library, they vaccinated 4,000 people. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, right? And that was happening, versions of that, maybe not quite at the level that Carmen, she's charismatic, uh, did it, but that's been happening around this country, and it's been one of the, the greatest uh, cures for equity uh, that I know of. Uh, and, and our Information Literacy Task Force will be looking at things like that to deliver a better result to the American people about uh, f through information what librarians have traditionally done. So I, my, the, the ultimate, my ultimate uh, point to you today, five minutes, I've got five minutes to say this, um, and uh, Terry and sorry, my staff know my proclivities here in the extemporaneous part of this. Um, the, my, basic, my basic message is really simple. The traditional virtues, values, and practices of librarians are exactly what this country needs today. We need, we need more focus on reading as the basic tool, 
To the extent that we're focused on the digital divide, we should, be, we should be focused, we need to be focused, we need to get the NTIA and the FCC and the federal government generally focused on practical use of the Internet, certi digital certifications. Uh, we need to make sure not just that, we're, that people are connected, uh, and libra libraries are really good at this, uh, but that people know how to use it for educational purposes, know how to use it for healthcare purposes, know how to use it for uh, workforce development, for job skill uh, development purposes. And uh, the work that you all do every day is about that, and I know that. Um, and, and, the, and then finally, the information ecology that we've always been a huge part of and the most trusted part of. Two things about that. One, let's not screw it up. That's where we've got to know our communities. Woke librarianship is great in some communities. Woke communities, though, do pay attention to what happened in, in the voting in San Francisco and LA recently. Um, uh, but know your community and don't lose the trust of the community. And then use that trust to do things like we've done over the last couple of years with the pandemic uh, to, uh, to help educate people to the virtues and value of everything from mask wearing, which is relatively minimal value, but some value, and to vaccination, which is huge value and has been saving lives. Um, it's what you've been doing, so all I'm telling you to do is go out and do more of what you've been doing. Help your libraries to do these things, uh, because we have a tremendous civilizational value, uh, and you are the carriers of that. Thank you. to put Crosby on the spot. We have, we have a few minutes if anybody has questions. There is a microphone right behind Crosby or you can come back up. Does anyone want to, this is your big chance to ask our IMLS director another burning question perhaps. Yes, Mary Ramey from Maryland. Hi, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed your conversations that you held during the pandemic. Uh, I was working from home. I think a lot of us were kind of uh, working from home during the pandemic. And it was just so nice to kind of like surface from the work that I was doing uh, at home on my computer and to, ha to be a part of such wonderful conversations. Uh, the people who you had conversations with were amazing, doing great work. And it was just, it was very inspiring. And I hope that you will continue that. Do you have plans to continue that? Uh, yes, in fact, thank you for that. I, I, I could I, I, I didn't pay her yet. Um, Mary, thank you. Uh, so we're, we're continuing conversations now focused on America 250, but we'll be dealing with a lot of the issues we're talking about. We just put up, you can see on our website, a conversation I had with uh, uh, Dr. Edna Medford, who is the Chair Emerita of the Howard University History Department and uh, is an uh, authority on the Emancipation Proclamation. And we did the conversation uh, in Lincoln's Cottage, originally Soldier's Cottage, where Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and it was, it's a great conversation. She's a wonderful uh, human being. And we talked about, about some of the issues that are polarizing the country and the citizenship test. She's, uh, it, it, she's very strong on, on, on hist historical education, uh, need for more of it and the problems with it. And then uh, this past week, uh, I, I did a conversation with uh, Bill McClay, Wilfred McClay, who's written a great history of the United States called Land of Hope, an invitation to the great American story. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Bill, Bill also is a great intellectual historian. He won the Merle Curtai Award uh, in Intellectual History of the, American, uh, of the Organization of American Historians. Um, and and we, we've, we talked a lot about the Declaration and the founders and, uh, and the problems that they created and, and the, the answers they hoped that we would come to. Uh, 
and we have in the future, um, I'll be talking to uh, Jeff Rosen, who's head of the Constitution Center and a great Supreme Court scholar in front of the American Association of State and Local History at their conference in September. Um, and then others who have agreed to, to talk, Arnold Rampersad, who's the bi biographer of Ralph Ellison, Langston Hughes, uh, and Jackie Robinson, among others, who, who will tell the story of African American literature. It's sort of the great canon of African American literature. Um, and Jill Lepore, who wrote another great history of the United States called These Truths, who writes for The New Yorker and is a Harvard historian. Um, and uh, let's see who else have, have we got. Um, uh, Gerald Early, who is the been head of the International Writers Center at Wash U and who is uh, uh, an expert on jazz and uh, sports and, uh, uh, and we'll, be, we'll be talking about the fun things in American culture and, and their, their influence. So we're going to continue the conversation but focus it a little bit on America 250. Awesome. Thank you Thank so you. much. Time? Now we might be at time. Help okay. me thank Crosby, our <laughs> wonderful director. And, and all these luminaries he's um, mentioned are just you know, a testament to his wonderful network that he is bringing their attention to libraries and museums, and we are so lucky to have him at this time. Uh, Crosby, thank you for being with us. We know you're very busy. <laughs> and um, coming up to Baltimore from Washington, not always easy, so thank you. And we're going to turn now to a session that Dennis is going to lead us through. Uh, which returns to the theme of news and getting the story out. Come on up. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, yes, yeah, so we have had several communications related um, sessions in the past at these conferences, um, kind of talking about some of the ins and outs, some of the standard kind of uh, tips and tricks, if you will. And we'll go over a, that a little bit again, kind of a refresher, especially with so many new faces. But there's also been a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of things that have changed uh, since we've last met related to communications. And we think a lot of really great um, lessons that ARPA and CARES have taught us in the realm of communications. So we're just going to kind of go over that. And there's been some great um, updates to the IMLS website, too, that help also use your data to kind of amplify what you're doing. So we want to just make sure you're aware of that um, and know how to kind of utilize that, hopefully to your advantage locally as well. Uh, this is kind of part one of two sort of companion presentations related to communications. Um, before the break, we're going to go over the kind of the IMLS view. And then after the break, we're going to talk about um, at the state library level, different approaches to communications, especially what the um, ARPA and pandemic era have taught us about approaches to communication. I keep zapping it. I keep trying to zap the thing to move. It doesn't work out that way. But anyway, um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, who is our audience at IMLS that we get the story out to? I have to take a brief shout out, and I don't want to say date myself, but maybe encapsulate myself in a particular period by using this Paperboy uh, screenshot from one of my favorite video games. And I thought, you know, who else gets the story out but a Paperboy? So there's a weird plug for a very specific period of time. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, to discuss, uh, before we review the ways um, your participation strengthens the way IMLS gets the story out, I wanted to offer some perspective into who we internally in the Grants Estates team interact with and how we interact with them. There's a lot of conversations about state libraries and what state libraries do internally, and we just wanted to make sure you were, you were aware of that. Um, we speak with our colleagues. Um, at the discretionary offices regularly. We share trends with them that we read about from uh, your SPR reports. We really kind of share what we're hearing in the field at site visits as well with them. Um, and then with IMLS leadership, we communicate with them and other colleagues with internal brown bag presentations and um, when information is needed for the agency's strategic plan and other publications. 
We collaborate with the communications team quite often. Uh, the more notable example of this was the blog series recently where we interviewed um, a number of state librarians um, amidst the pandemic. And then uh, IMLS also has a congressional liaison that we work with often, who often asks us questions about and information related to questions he receives from various elected officials. Um, so it's really, I, I think I've mentioned this before, having um, kind of immediate up-to-date information on a regular basis really helps in that con context of the congressional questions because we often don't have time to reach out to gather detailed information. Sometimes it's like in 15 minutes we need to know what's happening in Mississippi and Nevada and Rhode Island about this, you know, so it's always good to have this information on hand. So the next part is how we get the national story out. So now that we know who the audience is, um, and now we kind of, we're gonna discuss how. The collaborators and audiences I just mentioned inform the kinds of communication products we work on, sometimes by ourselves within grants to states, and sometimes on behalf of the entire agency. Uh, while they're not always the most glamorous type of communications, the agency's annual reports and budget justifications rely significantly on data, outcomes, and stories from the grants to states program. Research briefs that are spearheaded by our esteemed colleagues that have been here with us the past two days um, from the Office of Research and Evaluation. They frequently analyze data from the SPR, the Public Library Survey, and the State Library Administrative Agency Survey. Yes, that sneaky little biannual survey, we, we rely on that data frequently. Um, and as you'll witness in a few days, um, the IMLS and Grants Estates regularly submit proposals to present at conferences like ALA, PLA, YALSA, ATOM, and more to ensure that the library field is aware of the critical work being done at state libraries. And um, as I mentioned uh, just briefly earlier, uh, we use stories that we hear from you to inform blog posts that we write and other articles that are published on the IMLS website. Sometimes it's specifically being reached out to us from Office of Communication saying, hey, we have a specific theme in mind for a spotlight, you know, do you have any projects that would fit? And so we have that information on hand and we can kind of get the blog posts rolling. So um, this is a, a standard, uh, but still important reminder. Um, any news or project coverage um, at any moment in any format, please send to us your program officer um, and talk to us about any aspect of your state library's projects. I think that's probably not to jump ahead to talk about, we talk about ARPA a little bit later in subsequent slides, but that was one of the biggest takeaways and biggest helps for us is not waiting until the SPR to, to know what was happening as it was happening. And sometimes it was uh, a state kind of sending me a random photo from a library that sent it to them. It didn't have a lot of context. We didn't need a lot of context, but it was just enough, you know, a picture of what was going on to really help um, give us a more up to the minute idea of what was going on locally. Um, here's some reminders about ways to use social media. Uh, that hashtag IMLS grant um, is still heavily encouraged to be used across all social media platforms that use hashtags. Um, we're, we're checking those. Um, and yeah, please do not forget to mention us on Facebook uh, with the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And then Twitter's is shorter with the US underscore IMLS um, hash um, handle. And to in other ways you can do this as well, if you're not able to, especially with subgrantees, if they forget to use all of these things, if you find the uh, piece of social media content to uh, save the link or a screenshot, it might seem very simple and maybe a little bit like lo-fi, but all of that is a really helpful window into what's going on uh, locally. And so exemplary is, um, some of you are probably aware, is a little box that you can check in the SPR about uh, your SPR projects. And so we just want to uh, remind all of you to use that when applicable. Um, and really, we want to emphasize any aspect of a project that you feel deserves recognition or attention. Um, it really does help us. We feel confident when we see that you have indicated that something is exemplary. It makes us feel confident that you would want us to 
broadcast that project um, to various um, vested partners uh, around around the agency. Um, and it also is a search filter in the public view of the SPR, which is also very helpful. We have used that on many occasions. If we're searching for early liter literacy, STEM, uh, we can filter by exemplary to see what rises to the top. Uh, what we want to also emphasize is that just because you indicate something's exemplary, it does not suggest that the project is perfect, um, and it won't expose the project to undue scrutiny. I probably added that bullet with my state library background in mind because that was my hesitation when I was reporting. I was afraid that they would really look at it really carefully and it would, you know, expose something that I wasn't aware of, but it's not that serious. <laughs> but it does really help us um, get a sense that you're kind of rooting for that particular project. And this is just a quick refresher, and we have these links in um, the uh, virtual and digital versions. You have the links to the communications kit. Um, we have various ways that you can think about acknowledging IMLS. There are the long forms and the short forms. We understand that you know things uh, fluctuate and your space is limited sometimes. But at the minimum, to acknowledge Institute of Museum and Library Services and to consider um, articulating the federal source of the funds are very helpful, especially because we don't have a standard, very federal sounding um, agency name. So it's always helpful to remind people, this is the source of federal funds. And then um, an option is to use LSTA or other state library references as well. Um, and as you can see, to empower your subrecipients as well to use this. Um, I think somebody, a, a number of people asked me, yeah, after, Terry's presentation of the ARPA data, um, they said, how did you get all this information? Oh, we haven't even submitted in the SPR yet. And it's because having um, press releases that have our official language in it helps pick up from the clipping services that we use and we can find it a lot more um, efficiently. So I want to remind us as we enter the wild and wonderful uh, world of <laughs> bookmobile purchases, large scale equipment purchases, things that you know have a big real estate on them, is to uh, include IMLS attribution on these pieces of equipment and materials. Uh, as you can see, well, you might be able to see it. This is a um, Washington uh, State Library funded bookmobile. I'm glad I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> and, um, and they were able to put the IMLS logo very nicely in the um, wrapping of the, of the bookmobile. So, um, you know, as, they're, as you're working on those bookmobile wrap options, there's always that potential there. And I wanted to also shout out virtually to uh, Kellen from Alabama, who uh, took the time to share with me the digital uh, version of the um, label they're printing on all of their... Um, ARPA funded uh, uh, equipment. And so it was nice because it's hard for, for a state library to track down a subrecipient saying, hey, can you take a picture of this label on this laptop? But this is just a great way of letting me know, hey, that we're doing this with our subrecipients and it just gives me a really great um, a sample. So the other element of communication is the IMLS website. There is a lot of state library material on the IMLS website that I just wanted to make you all aware of and or remind you of. Um, the top left is what we referred to a little bit yesterday when I talked about the five-year plan, whereas we're going to be working with you all on the sort of Cliff's Notes version of your five-year plan goals, and, and this is kind of a way for anybody visiting the IMLS website to have a quick synopsis of what you're focusing on for the next five years. So there's a lot of important communication potential there. Um, in the bottom left, you can see we already have a brand newly updated uh, state profile page for Oregon with their new state librarian in Wendy. So she submitted her headshot and a new quote. That will be something that we will reach out to you all with the start of a new five-year plan period. If you have the same state librarian, we'll just check to see if there's any updated information, a new quote to talk about the ne next five years. And then outside of just the five-year plan period, if you have a new state librarian, and I know many of you are actively searching for new state librarians, and there's a little bit of turnover, um, when, whenever they come on board, we would want to update this information as soon as, as, soon as possible. So just keep that in mind. And then on the 
on the right is um, some project examples from uh, the Connecticut uh, State Library State Profile page. And we'll be working through new project examples and highlights for every, every state library um, kind of to go along with the new five-year plan period. So we'll also be running them by you all. And you know when there are great photos to support those project examples, they kind of rise to the top to kind of get that visual attention. So we'll, we'll be working with you um, on that, or we may have some from the wonderful additional materials that you provide us in the SPR. So um, uh, coming soon, I mentioned that there'll be updated project highlights. We'll be reviewing the current state librarian quotes. And, um, and then we'll be also adding every, every state's updated uh, five-year plans once they've been approved. And in the fall of 2022, you'll expect to be hearing from us about that. So the plan will be behind everybody. There'll be a nice sigh of relief and then we'll get cracking on that. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, in addition to those, those are kind of what I would call like the standard elements of the IMLS website that uh, bring the um, state library information to the forefront. There's been some new features that showcase state libraries and grants in, in really dynamic ways that I think will be helpful for you to be aware of and, um, and for you to kind of play around with and to, and to check out. So this is the first of the site updates. Um, if you've been to the IMLS website recently, this is on the landing page if you scroll down at the, below the fold where there's an IMLS kind of in your state national view. So there is a lot of layers and a lot of filters and a lot of kind of like baked in content with, um, with this. And so in this screenshot, you see, let's see, yeah, you can see the grants to states uh, filter at the top there. So you're, you can either filter by discretionary and grants to states funds kind of collectively, or you can look at just grants to states and you can kind of see how the funding is distributed there. Uh, what I wanna really highlight is when you click on each state, to the left there'll be ra um, randomly selected highlights within the state. For the Mississippi example, the, the highlight is actually the state library. So I wanted to kind of shout that out. But then if you click on the state, you can kind of see a breakdown of how the funds are distributed across the state. And then from there, you can click that view details. Um, and there's actually like a state dashboard for every state. So there's, there's a, it's a relatively new development and there's a, a lot going on. Um, and so there's a lot to click in and it's just, it's a, it's a helpful uh, snapshot, especially we, um, this, this dashboard and these visualizations were built for the sort of congressional inquiries about, okay, what's going on in, in this uh, district, in this elected officials area of interest. Um, and constituency. And so while it may not be the most detailed, robust, you know, let's get into every single element of your SPR projects visualized here, it gives a sense of, of it at least brings grants to states into the fray with the rest of the picture of what's going on in your state, which I think is, is really helpful. This is an example of a part of the state dashboard. You can see um, this is North Dakota, and it just breaks down how the funding is, uh, lays out. I want to mention, too, briefly, that you can actually download this data as well. So if you want to kind of play with it yourself and see how it breaks down, uh, that might be interesting. There's, uh, I had to click, by the way, this is a disclaimer, You because of the timing of when SPR data is submitted, the, our discretionary colleagues have more recent data because that data is put in at the application and awarding level. We don't put in your data until it's finalized after the SPR. So I clicked to the 2019 tab to kind of get the um, the most recent grants to states picture. But you can see uh, under grants to states, you'll see a kind of a focal area snapshot of how LSTA funding with local match is kind of contributing to the larger focal area. And I want to remind and or inform for people who may not know is that the your SPR data does not live in a vacuum behind the login that you use for submission. Once we have accepted the SPR, um, your SPR, it gets kind of pushed to a public view of SPR data. And this goes back um, from 2014 onward and get, it offers an interesting picture of, of your funds. So. 
I wanted to remind everybody of that. There's the URL for the public view. There are search elements. There are ways you can refine the search. If you're interested in seeing what other states are doing in similar areas, it's a nice snapshot. I want to remind and encourage and put you at ease that it does not include every single detail. Um, it does not include budget detail and any additional materials that you upload don't transfer over. So um, there's that kind of barrier a little bit, but it's a good, a good way of seeing a top level uh, synopsis of things. So I, I want to emphasize too that the public view is a way of thinking about the way you're uh, structuring your SPR as well. You know, your report is a compliance piece for us, of course, but we're hoping that it is simultaneously uh, a vehicle for communicating what your state is doing. And we are hoping that we've used the SPR public view many times if people have asked us, you know, do you, can you give me a sense of what other states are doing in databases or statewide courier or anything like that? It's just interesting perspectives. So I want to just remind everybody as they're writing their reports that it's um, something to keep in mind as you're writing. So something else that's a hidden gem, I think, of the SPR public view is a top-level summary of each state's SPR data. Now, this summary view provides you with a way to quickly review the work your state has done across several years, covering data elements like total number of projects, S LSTA compared to match funds, and which focal areas were covered by your projects. Something else that appears in the summary view is sub-award info. And you might be thinking to yourself, how did IMLS get that data? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and as you can see, it's hard to see here, but if you're in the public view, it is a sneaky little link at the top that says view summaries. And it really, there's a lot of dynamic stuff going on with that one. So I recommend playing around with it. So, sub-award info, I have confirmed from a reliable source, which is me, that there is a lesser known area of the SPR entitled sub-award info, where you are able to enter unique information about your sub-granting process that goes beyond the type of reporting that you have to do for funded projects. Not only is it illuminating for us at IMLS, but the hope is that it can give you a helpful picture of your sub-award activity, especially over the years. So, um, and as you can see from these fields, maybe you can see them. But basically, obviously when we're looking at the SPR, we're just looking at what was funded because that's what we're looking for from a review perspective. But this gives us another layer of, oh, how many people actually applied for those sub-awards? How many people actually got the funds from those applications? All of those pieces of information that are just really illuminating, especially when you're looking at the view summaries element. So, um, we, we, uh, it's not a compliance part, part of the SPR, which is why it can kind of sneakily fall under the radar, um, which is why we wanted to bring it everybody's attention now, especially since there's an influx of sub-awarding. Uh, but it, what's another great kind of saving grace of this particular feature is it doesn't get locked for editing after the um, SPR is accepted for the year because it doesn't have that same kind of control over it like the formal report does. So if you're seeing this for the first time and you're like, wow, this would be great to retroactively backfill with the data that I have, um, you can do that. You can just go back as far as you have the data and add that um, data in retroactively. And then that will feed up into the um, that view summaries area that I was just showing you. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of lessons that we learned from CARES and ARPA related to communication. Um, most importantly being, give us up to the minute, however informal communication that you can, that you can provide to us. Um, and so we got a lot of folks sharing press releases with us, mentioning us um, in social media, and really, like I mentioned before, casual informal email updates. Sometimes it was a picture of this uh, this event that was being held with, you know, ARPA ARPA funds or, or something like that. Um, it can be it can really be a quick, hey, I just wanted to let you know this is going on. It can be a quick forward. It doesn't have to be like, dear sir or madam, fi please find attached. You know, it doesn't have to be that formal at all. Um, it really helps us tremendously. So I wanted to, before we close out, we've been talking a lot about getting the story out. We've been talking a lot about it being really important to 
amplify what the work that you're doing. And we've heard in the past, well, we'd love to do that, but we, I thought we couldn't because I thought IMLS does not fund um, marketing and advocacy. That is correct. We do not fund marketing or advocacy, advocacy officially, but there is an important distinct, uh, distinction between those two areas. Um, and so I wanted to kind of lay that out very specifically. Uh, we, you should make sure it can be fundable as long as you're making sure the work that's being funded falls under an appropriate five-year plan goal. Um, most commonly professional development, especially if you want to equip your librarians across the state to increase their ability to communicate. Just on a general level, that is a professional development skill and not a, a workshop to it, you know, lobby for more funding or how to raise a good, how to put a good fundraiser together. Those are very separate ideas. Um, and then you think of the, also the goal of the funded activity. Are you attempting to provide professional development to the library workforce in the area of effective communication? Or are you designing your training to empower attendees to raise money effectively, write an engaging letter to a, their elected official? The former is allowable and the latter is, is not allowable. So uh, that's just, Making sure that it's under, even if you're having a training and maybe it's a workshop and you're workshopping effective communication, using an LSTA funded project as your concrete example to help train librarians on how to communicate is the way that you can really equip the state and your librarians with how to get the story out and how to be better communicators while still falling under allowable cost principles and making sure you're steering clear of empowering people to just like generally promote the use of the library, which is where it kind of becomes a red flag. So that was a kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, communications and everything, but uh, we wanna thank you all so much. We know that you have enough to do with the annual reporting process, but knowing what's going on as it's happening, I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is on a number of areas. So it's it's making a big impact for us internally and we hope that it's also going to benefit all of you as well for us to kind of be broadcasting the work that you're doing as well. So we have a tiny little bit of time for questions, but um, if not, we can also start checking out of our rooms, so. <laughs> Um, on the sub-award info, do you want us to put CARES and ARPA all together for the last two years or just do LSTA sub-awards? Well, isn't that interesting? All together? I would think so. I think that reflects just the sheer volume of what you're, what you're dealing with. So I would, I would say yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great question. Sulin. So I have not forwarded any press releases or anything to you ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm, 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 taking, I'm taking the hit, but um, I ask everyone to, to hashtag you and at you, and I, are you getting those? Yes, yes we are. And I, I, I can't guarantee, especially we're not behind the wheel of the social media engine, if you will. Um, and But if it's not retweeted or shared, it doesn't mean that we're not seeing it. There's, um, even internally, they're aggregating all of those all of that communication that we're getting and we're reading it and we're seeing it. So it's, it's, it's working tremendously. Dennis, I have a question from the virtual world. I know. Yes. It's God <laughs> um, One of the states offered a program for libraries to develop a marketing plan. Would this fit within the guidelines? No. I, I don't, I think a marketing plan, it sounds unless it's a marketing plan for statewide databases or something that's completely LSTA funded, I would, uh, I, Terry's nodding, so yes, uh, that would be okay, but if it's, if it's just to get people to use the library in a very general sense, that's when it becomes too broad to be allowable. Yeah. All right, well thank you all for your questions, and yeah, I guess we can, 
take our morning extended break to check out of our rooms and we'll be back at 1045. Is that right? Okay. Bring in the conference back from the break, the extended break. We're going to have a 45 minute panel. Uh, we're going to be adhering to time for this one because the next segment is lunch. Uh, but this is a panel, this is another panel that Madison put together and it's going to follow on to the things you just heard from Dennis, but from the state perspective. So Madison, take it away. Now I'm having the earring issue from yesterday. Um, thanks everyone and, and thanks to Dennis for giving that great introduction on getting the story out and how we communicate the value of your work um, out to the public. Um, but in terms of how you communicate the value of your work. We have some of your peers here to share their information and how they do it. We know, um, as, we, as we like to joke around, if you've been to one state library, you've been to one state library. Um, so everyone has different resources and different ways of doing things. And so we have quite uh, an array of states here today who's gonna share their perspectives. Um, we have Rob Favini from Massachusetts. We have Mary Ramey from the home state of Maryland, um, Evan Struble from Ohio, and Susan Mark from Wyoming. So I will let Rob take it away. Hey, thank you. Can everyone hear me or do I have to move this? A little bit for the home viewers? Yeah. Okay. And uh, at home viewers, so let's shout out to uh, Lindsay and Shelley from Ranch. They're here virtually, I hope. Uh, um, nope. Oh wait, you know what? I think Mary should go first. <laughs> no, I think we went in alphabetical order by states, right? And I, because I was wishing I was from Alaska when oh, we did that. Yes. Yeah, or was not from Alaska. Anyway, uh, Mary Ramey, Maryland State Library, uh, and I have to start out by saying that our state has not been great at communicating impact. We are a very new state agency. Um, we separated from our State Department of Education about four years ago, which was huge. It was like a divorce. Uh, but it actually, for us, turned out really, really great. Uh, however, we had to rebuild many of our, the components of our office from the ground up, which is really difficult because we're librarians. Anyway, uh, we're a very tiny agency as well. We have about 11 people in our office. We do not have a full-time marketing person. So um, the thing that I wanted to talk about today was, oh, the bigger button, thank you. Here we go. And I also had to include some Maryland propaganda in here. This is required by Maryland state law. So I have some Oriole representation there. Um, so, and I have all of the points I just made. We separated from the state board, very small agency, no full-time marketing staff. So, but when we got the ARPA money, we were like, dang, that's a lot of money. It was $3.3 million, and we were thrilled, as I heard from all of you, that you were also thrilled to get that ARPA funding. Uh, and I really wanted to create a press release, which we have never done. This was a very modest goal. Um, and what I did was I started the press release by writing a list of all the grants that we gave out and like a sentence about the purpose. And then uh, my boss, my boss's boss, they reworked it and they created something really great from the list that I had given them as a prompt to kind of write this press release. But there was also some infrastructure stuff that we needed to create around the press release. Like we had no one to communicate our press release to. So I created a press release contact list just by doing some Google research on the internet to find out um, you know, the, the organization's names, their emails address, the email address, and I created a list for newspapers, TV stations, online publications, et cetera. But it was like the, the, the stuff we needed in place to make our uh, press release effective. So our old list had about a dozen contacts, our new list has 78. So um, we created the press release about ARPA funds uh, and how we distributed the ARPA funds to the Maryland library systems. But just to give you an idea of how long it took 
We st I started writing that press release in August of 2021, and we didn't release it until mid-October. So it was, it was definitely for us a big step, but a small beginning. Now part of, I used to work, before I worked in libraries, I had a career working in advertising and marketing, which is helpful. Um, and I really thought it was important to have a boilerplate paragraph at the bottom of our press relief. And this is really small, this is a baby step, but the boilerplate is also, I think, really important because it helps to describe who we are as a state agency and what we do. Uh, for example, we are not a library, we are a state agency, and this boilerplate kind of says what we're in charge of, um, what we touch as a, as a state agency. And we've started using this boilerplate language in all our press releases. It's gonna get uh, also uh, flowed into our new website that we're working on as well. It's really a kind of, the, the, the boilerplate paragraph for me was really about establishing our identity. So we sent the press release to the media list. We uploaded it to our website as well. Uh, and we also sent the press release to Madison, our program officer at IMLS. Oh, and that is Mr. Trashwheel in the lower right hand corner. If you don't know Mr. Trashwheel, he um, rides around the Inner Harbor and picks up trash. There's also a Mrs. Trashwheel, but I won't get into that. No. And that's really it for me. Anybody have any questions? I have questions about the trash wheel. I, mean, <laughs> I want to know why they're gender, but no. Good question. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. I'll go now. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Rob Favini from the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. Um, I'm gonna tell kind of a story of um, ongoing information that we put out to, to kind of illustrate the work that we do. Uh, a little background on the MBLC. Um, there is, right off the bat, really no reason for me to show you these people. Um, they're on our website. Um, I put them out there because if you are developing a role-playing Edwardian murder mystery game, these are some great names. I just really was captivated with that. Um, we were uh, established as a state agency in 1890. Uh, we used to say we're the oldest state agency, library agency, but we always get in trouble with New Hampshire. Uh, that's right, Lori. We'll have to have a discussion after. Uh, depends how you define it. Uh, and it, they were, we were uh, originally organized as uh, the Free Public Library Commission uh, by an act to promote the establishment and efficiency of free public libraries. These people here in front of you are the original commissioners. We do have commissioners to this day uh, without such interesting names. Uh, kind of that mission from our current strategic plan uh, has been updated and, and, and our mission now is to promote equitable access, advance innovation, and foster resilience in libraries across the Commonwealth through funding, guidance, partnerships, and the coordination of state services. Uh, why this is important is because we do this work primarily through state and federal funds. Uh, the operations of libraries, as everyone knows, is really local funding. Um, so it's important for us to tell kind of the story to our key um, vested partners because we provide the information for them to go and advocate for funding. So that's kind of the, the whole kind of enterprise that we're doing here. And in many ways, um, our story closely aligns with LSTA. Um, so we really are just elaborating the work that LSTA does in many instances. Um, so I'm gonna talk about who we tell the story to, what story we tell them, and a couple tools that we use to do this. And we tell the story basically to anyone who will listen. Uh, I, I did a very poor job of trying to make a uh, kind of an infographic. Uh, our, our real primary audiences to talk to is, is the state legislature because that's where we get most of our funding for the pro programs that we're talking about. But a lot of the other partners are the folks that are actually doing the advocacy in Massachusetts for libraries. So we have a lot of regional um, advocacy groups. Our affiliate um, uh, organization, the Massachusetts Library Association, and also, I'm sorry, the Massachusetts is the Library Association is not an affiliate. I get them confused with the system. <laughs> <laughs> Strike, we'll, we'll edit this out. Um, 
But the Massachusetts Library Association is key because they are the drivers of the statewide advocacy effort in Massachusetts. Uh, so they're important folks that we, we talk to. Um, what we do to tell the story is a couple of things that are ongoing. One of is the legislative agenda that we create every year. Uh, what you're going to see now is also a big shout out back at the agency to Celeste Bruno and Matt Perry. Uh, they're our communications team and they have worked very hard and very long many years and this is the, really how they've uh, formulated it for this year with input from a lot of folks. So every year we do set a legislative agenda. Uh, we talk to our affiliate organizations, we talk to our vested partners, and we also talk to the library community to try to get a read on what is important for them that given year. Uh, you can take a look at very uh, detail about the legislative agenda with the URL that's on the screen. So we always try to do, this is the important thing, is we try to reframe things. I don't know if everyone's been to a, a, an event with a either local, state, or federal pol politician. And a lot of them start with, ah, the library. I remember Mrs. Anderson and the book, I can just smell the book room now, and, and she opened a world to me. And that's, that's great, that happens. Uh, but really what we want to do is frame things in the language of the audience. And so, you know, we're really moving towards getting away from story hour and talking about early literacy. Um, if you're around politicians, catnip is workforce development. Uh, really gets their attention and, and really helps them out. So we are really talking in terms of impact, not so much what the programs look like. And we're finding that that's been effective. And just a little bit um, kind of a call out of some of the things. So, you know, where these are things that are we're learning from our libraries that are important to them. So it's, you know, addressing mental health, trying to get internet technology to everyone, the workforce development things. So that's how we're kind of framing those stories. We also take this as an opportunity to highlight the work of our affiliates, the aforementioned Massachusetts Library System, which provides a lot of training, but also they are in charge of delivery and how that impacts every library in the state. Um, also, we try to um, uh, illustrate for um, our federal audience the impact LSTA funds have on libraries throughout Massachusetts. So we have a page where folks can go by congressional district and they can see the impact that they're seeing and this really helps with talking to staff especially. And here's where we actually call out specific grants. These are uh, sub-grants that we have with the amount of money and the impact. So a lot of times we'll send out press releases throughout the year saying, hey, in your district this is happening, but having one place to point folks to has been very, very helpful for us. Um, so the storytelling tips that we always live by is don't assume that they've heard the story before, and even if they have heard the story before, you're gonna tell it to them again. Um, and you really have to tap into their culture, use their language, and, and really key in on things that's gonna make them excited and become, um, you know, energized for this. And yes, you have to do all of the heavy lifting. Um, you know, you have to really, really feed the information out to folks to make it useful. And that's it. Pass that down. Thank you, Rob. So I'm going to drill down just a little deeper on a couple of different facets. Some of this uh, has already been covered by some of my fellow panelists, and some of this actually um, Crosby Kemper spoke to earlier this morning. So uh, not only is Cindy Boyden stealing my thunder, but also the head of IMLS is stealing my thunder. <laughs> now, so it really is crucial to identify the target audience, especially in Ohio, because the State Library of Ohio is a library. So different from Mary, we do get state funds for the library portion of the state library. And there's initially so much confusion over um, the difference between the funds, the federal funds and the state funds, not to mention that in Ohio, our public libraries are very fortunate to receive the public library fund in Ohio. And so inevitably, when the state librarian or I or someone is in front of a budget subcommittee, they're like, oh, you get all that money from the PLF. And we're like, no, we don't. We get pennies from you. But let me, yes, but I'm still going to be kind. Um, so 
when you work with the legislature, um, you know, Rob said it best, you're gonna do the heavy lifting, you're gonna do the research, you need to know who's on your budget subcommittees from the Senate, from the House, find out what their hometowns are, find out what district they represent, and start getting those examples in your back pocket. It's gonna take a lot of work because it's not always as obvious as saying, oh, I gave an ARPA grant to Lima, Ohio, and that's where the representative is from. Sometimes you really have to look at your statewide initiatives and drill it down because perhaps that county hasn't gotten an LSTA grant in a while, so you still wanna make sure that they see the statewide impact of the initiatives that you're doing with the federal funds. And I would love to say that there's an easy way to do this, to cut through the noise, but it is, it is a challenge, and not just because Ohio is triple red. Um, it's a challenge because those subcommittees change during each session of the legislature. And so you might think that you know who the five or seven people you're speaking to last year, but they might have all changed or turned over or been term limited or whatever. And so there are a lot of challenges and you have to do that heavy lifting. Um, working with your own board of trustees at the State Library is similar. It's, it's about knowing their backgrounds, where they came from, what their passion projects are, so that when you're at the podium, I know, oh, Terry's all about the K-12 library community. I need to speak to what are the initiatives and what are the grants that we've given recently to um, the schools in, in Ohio. Um, Sometimes it can be a challenge, again, because of the turnover and maybe the lack of foreknowledge. Sometimes you end up with someone on your board of trustees that was placed there rather than uh, maybe uh, going through the typical process. And so it is about those connections behind the scenes to figure out what it is that motivates them and drives them. The library community themselves, this is where um, what Crosby said earlier really resonated because it is that local touch that matters. And it's not easy. I mean, like, the, I, you know, like you said, it's a lot of heavy lifting and there isn't a lot of staff to do it, but this is when your connections really pay off. Get on every agenda for your regional library systems, for maybe some of your, even your metro libraries, if you're fortunate to have them in your state. Get three minutes of FaceTime, five minutes of FaceTime, find a, find a meeting, travel to Cleveland, whatever you need to do. Um, but again, when you're going into that meeting, ask the meeting organizer who's going to be in the room so that you're prepared with those stories and those anecdotes and the data, although I'm a story guy, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. Um, tailoring your approach is key. Um, certain vested partners, I love reframing that word away from stakeholders. Um, certain vested partners are much more driven by data. That's not where my heart lives, and so it's always a little bit of a challenge for me to push back against that need, but recognizing that everyone responds differently, I think is key um, to being an administrator at a state library. Um, but those stories, man, the way that they can tug at the heart and elicit a teardrop, that's where I'm just like, I wanna pull that out of people. I'm just like, yeah, I can move you with some of my grant initiatives, absolutely. Like, this is real. I mean, it's real. It's, it's, it's money, but it's, it's real. It, it impacts at the local level. Delivery method, same thing, different every time. Know your audience. Do they wanna hear from you verbally? Do they wanna see it in a press release? I love the idea of uh, the boilerplate, the birth of the boilerplate. I'm already thinking how I can take that home. Um, but knowing that folks might need a visual aid versus maybe you have 30 seconds with the legislature and you've got to have your elevator speech ready as you're shaking their hand and it's super awkward, um, I, think that that's, I think that that's key. And it's something that, frankly, I, we can do better. I think just modulating that, it's so easy to fall back into this idea of, oh, I've got my annual report. My marketing person whipped up this beautiful one pager and it's lovely. But this whole idea of one size fits all just doesn't cut it, it doesn't. And again, you know, I keep going back to what Rob said, but it's true, it's, a lot. it's labor intensive, it's a lot of work. Um, so being open to the way that you tailor your approach and the delivery method, I think, are super key. Next slide is just, I mean, some of this you all are working with as well. I'm gonna say this, uh, your, sub-grantees or your libraries that are taking advantage of your statewide initiatives, they can be some of your best evangelists for who you are. But you've got to take the time to find them out, and sometimes just a Google alert isn't enough. Um, it takes, you know, making calls, pounding the pavements. There's me in a giant book at Toledo, yay. I'm, <laughs> I'm posing with my coffee. Um, but it, sometimes it takes going to the places to see how they're implementing what it is that, that you have put forth, and then, and then taking the time to republicize that and reshare it. 
Um, the top left for you, um, for our board of trustees, I'm, in, I'm entrusted with putting together a board packet each time we meet. And I always, with ARPA in particular, I try to collect hyperlinks of um, ARPA subgrantees that are already using their funds or, almost, or you know, almost done with their projects so that our board is kept apprised in case they don't have an idea. And then when the board meeting actually happens, I'm up at the podium and I can speak to them or even bring them in as guest speakers to save my voice. Um, <laughs> when I'm up at the podium as well. And so none of this is necessarily groundbreaking, but it's just another reminder that you have to do it differently for different audiences. And so that's why I'm here, that's why I'm part of the panel today, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about Ohio. And there's my lovely headshot. Well, I'm Susan from the Wyoming State Library, and I was so excited about our 150th birthday in December that I neglected to do an actual title slide. <laughs> so um, we are fortunate in our agency that we do have a dedicated marketing work unit. I'm on it, and then we have one other person on it. And really, the audiences that we are trying to reach, the uh, biggest one is our library community. Wyoming has a very collaborative library community. Um, and they're the ones who are going to be able to reach out into their communities better than we can. So we really rely on them to do the groundwork. And as came up in discussion yesterday, a lot of times, you know, these are small libraries without a lot of resources, so we want to make it easy for them. Um, our legislators and elected officials, we want to show them what the funds are accomplishing. It's another audience. We, uh, another audience is the agency we're part of. We want to show them how we're contributing to the sex success of the agency. Um, we're part of the Department of Administration and Information, which has everything from us to motor pool. It's kind of an interesting agency. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the general public. We want them to know what's available to them and uh, uh, demonstrating the value of libraries. So I brought some examples of what we do. On our website, we do have an LSD landing page. There is a fact sheet we put together initially for legislators that we are in need of updating, have our plan, have our evaluations, have links to the past ones. So it's all in one place there. This is our blog. blog is kind of, our blog is kind of like information central. It's where pretty much everything gets dumped into that we're putting out there. Um, and we post usually once or twice a day during the week. Uh, some of the blog posts that we did related to IMLS funding, uh, a promotional campaign we'll talk about in a minute, get out there and go wild. Uh, you, when we got ARPA funds, we announced when we received them, we announced when we worked with our libraries to put together the plan to spend them, uh, when we got our evaluation, when we put out the survey that was part of the evaluation, uh, director's annual work session, which is another uh, LSTA-funded project. Rowdy Randy, this was fun. We sent a, a book author out to elementary schools, and she was awesome. And then a lot of times we have somebody, we have a database instruction librarian who will do little features on different databases, and you know, both LSTA-funded and not. Uh, the Outrider is our electronic newsletter. It goes out to more than 1,100 people on our mailing list, 10 to 12 times annually. Um, it's, it's essentially a condensed version of our blog, so, uh, which is why I say you know, the blog is kind of the dumping place for everything we're trying to put out there, and then we have to shorten it considerably and put this out. We do press releases. We have more than 100 uh, media outlets on our press, press release list. When I uh, got into the work unit, I went out to the Wyoming Press Association site. There's uh, one for broadcasters and pulled everything I could from everyone I could find in Wyoming, and plus a few outlets that cover parts of Wyoming that aren't in the state. Uh, so we, we did a press release on Get Out There and Go Wild. Uh, when we got the ARPA funding and we got Tumble Books and Teen Book Cloud, we announced that. Uh, again, the, the Gale Business Plan Builder, you know, um, I think, was it you that said that it's, which one of you was it said that, that workforce development is catnip? Yep, 
Yeah, that's it. Our Wyoming Virtual Library, which is our e-books, which have been greatly expanded. So, and we have pretty good luck with our press releases. And I come from newspapers, and I was the person who stood at the fax machine and disposed of press releases that weren't worth it. Um, and I can give you a tip if you get, a, get an Associated Press style book, because the closest you come to letting them copy and paste, the more likely you're gonna get your press release run. Please do not start your press release by saying the State Library is pleased and proud to announce because you have never seen a news reporter start a story that way. Start with the, you know, lead with what matters to people out there. So, uh, this is our agency newsletter. We contribute something every week. Our, um, we have a kind of a did you know and we'll feature different things. Uh, our, our newsletter gets linked in this. Uh, the director's work se session, when we talk about reaching out to the library community, um, you know, one of the most effective things is really working through our directors. Wyoming has 31 public and academic directors, so we can actually get most of them in a room. So uh, uh, this is a really good way for one-on-one -on -one communication with them. And this was Rowdy Randy. The Wyoming Library Association holds their legislative reception in our building, so we often put out displays. And so we had pictures, we had adorable little thank you notes from oh. kids. So while the legislators are milling about eating and drinking, they can see what IMLS funds did. So, and this, this is exciting. When we got the ARPA funds, we thought we are not gonna get this kind of opportunity again to really promote what's in the LSDA funded databases. So, um, uh, this is GoWild.com. Be sure to use a Y. I'm not sure what you will get if you use an I. Um, I haven't looked and I don't want to know. <laughs> but we've got, we've got videos that are uh, links to put them straight into some of these resources that are funded with um, LSTA, you know, with ARPA, you know, those sorts of resources featuring one each month over four months. Um, we rebranded our, our, you know, where we have all our electronic resources, that page to match the rest of the campaign. Uh, we have a toolkit. You know, again, it's very important for us to work, at, work through our local libraries because they have the community reach and uh, we have all sorts of things that they can download from this toolkit as part of this campaign. And so some of the campaign assets, uh, we did do some printed things for them. We did, we did posters, bookmarks, we did big banners they could put up in their libraries. We have this downloadable poster. Uh, we gave them web graphics. We're seeing them use them all over on social media. Uh, you know, of course, the videos, the videos are great. If you get a chance, go to GoWild.com and look at the videos. Uh, social media cover images, uh, we've seen them using those. Uh, Pre-written content, so all they've got to do is take this content and pop it into a social media post. And then if they want to send out an HTML email template, there's one of those. And I think that's it for me. So we, we have fun, we do a lot. Seriously, the, e the earring thing is no joke. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for sharing your perspectives. Um, does anyone in the room have any questions or want to share their own insights into how they communicate what they do to their state? community, and I already see New Hampshire coming up to the mic. Um, <laughs> what? I know. Well, I just wanted to say two things. Um, one is that I want to shout out to my New England counterparts because we're going to be presenting a session at NELA 
about our ARPA monies, and it's not just about what we did with it, but where we go from there. And I would encourage everybody to reach out to your state chapters or your regional associations to try to communicate in that way with them because you need to, it, sometimes people get the best ideas from just hearing what others are doing and, and really trying to get them on board and understand what these monies meant to us as a state and a region and also nationally. Second thing is that in one of the things we found was really effective in New Hampshire with the ARPA monies. When we did our competitive grant round two, I supplied all of our grantees, and we had 45 of them, um, with a template press release and template social media content. And because we did that, they blasted stuff out in January when the awards were announced, um, you know, through our press release. But then we had two of our congressional representatives, because of all of that press, reach out to us to have uh, meetings, virtual meetings with us and our libraries about these funds. So that was a big deal because they'd never reached out to us before. So I just wanted to share that out because it really was worth it. Great. And now we have Rhode Island coming up to the mic. Um, I just have a, a question, mostly for Rob, but um, I think the graphics on what you shared were so nice and polished and professional looking. Do you pay for those? Do you have like a secret for how everything looks so good? Yeah, Maybe, only, yeah. Our okay. secret is we hire a uh, marketing firm. Cool. <laughs> so those, Does, those, and, and what was nice is that um, it actually, it covers a lot of our different areas too, so we have the same kind of graphic package, yeah. and that same, I know there's a word for the type of, um, not, not, no, no, I knew that. Um, <laughs> but the, you know, the characters of people, it's very standard, and it's uh, very, very hot right now. Um, I forget what they call it, but it, so it goes across a lot of things that we do, but yeah, that we actually take that out of our administrative budget to, to, to pay for that, and that, they also, they do a lot of printing for us, so it's a, it's a long-standing relationship. Do any of the other panelists have suggestions for n not expensive ways to do that? I, so I have if, one. It's okay if you don't. I have one. Um, our Office of Communications is, is very wonderful, but they're like right now they're literally two people. Um, and so Dennis and I, when, when we need graphics, such as for your awards that we made you, um, we use Canva, which is an app, it's a free app. Yeah. Um, you don't need to be a graphic designer. There are free templates you can use in any sort of like social media post or, or logo or whatever. Um, it's come in quite, quite handy for both my personal life and professionally with what we do in Grants and States. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? Cindy and Laura, do we have anything coming in on the chat? You know we do. You know we do. Um, Georgia provides awardees a marketing toolkit uh, for their ARPA grants as well on, on their ARPA grant website. Um, and uh, someone commented, I can see ways, after these two sessions, I can see ways we can update and expand on the toolkits that we use. Um, and I'm reading this for the first time, so bear with me. Um, we have a whole training on communications, which includes a toolkit with sample press releases, logo guidelines, and acknowledgement requirements. Beautiful. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Terry DeVoe here. Wondering, kind of along the lines of Nicolette's question, just resource-wise, I mean, it's clear that we had a few panelists with prior experience in this arena, which is amazing. But what kind of human resources do you have in each of your state libraries to do this sort of work, or how do you distribute it? Are you using contracts? Um, it sounded like there were some campaigns that were funded. Like, what is the nuts and bolts of getting this kind of work done for each of you? I'll go. Um, as I said, we have a marketing unit. I'm more the word person. And uh, the other person that works in there does the website and does graphic design, is very good at it. He came to us from Starnet. He was doing work for them. And uh, if you had those really cool uh, eclipse glasses, that was, that was Greg. 
And uh, so, you, and of course, my job is also partly the LSTA and those sorts of things. For the get out there and go wild, we did go out to a marketing firm. That was beyond capability. And our other LSTA coordinator manages our social media, which I forgot to mention. Everything that goes out on the blog goes out on Facebook and Twitter, our two social media channels. And in Ohio, we have a marketing department of one. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the, um, I don't know, the natural friction between state funds and federal funds can come to the fore because our state funds are much more threatened, sadly, than our federal funds are. And so I do feel that oftentimes she's pulled into promoting those operations that the physical library does that receives the state funds for. And so it really is an all hands on deck situation for my team, the development team. Um, I used to have an LSTA coordinator that would help me greatly with this. And you know, she, that position is vacant at the moment, but it is, it is a lot of work with, with my team of consultants, the LSTA coordinator, so that we can do that research and that legwork and position the state librarian to be shown in the best light when she is giving the testimony, when she is pounding the pavement and attending those meetings. And I obviously do a lot of that work myself as well, but there really isn't, I mean, beyond the development team and they're fantastic. I don't, I don't have like a cadre of, of marketing folks. It is just kind of digging deep and finding the stories and, and, and it just takes time. I mean, it just takes time. Yeah, we have one half-time marketing person. Uh, she works for the Library for the Blind and the Print Disabled in our state. So she's very busy on her side of the agency. Um, so any marketing communications that we do, we do it as a team. State librarian helps, uh, my boss helps. Uh, everybody who's there and on board helps, but we're still establishing kind of a communication flow and setting up uh, like how we're gonna do it in the future. This is all new stuff for us. So we have a very small but mighty two-person communications team, um, and what they're good at is they coordinate all communication, not just for grants and funding and things like that. So we're very well trained to funnel everything through them. Um, and then they have uh, other communication uh, methods that they do as well. Uh, so, and then, um, again, knowing, establishing relationship with a uh, marketing firm we've been using for a while, they're able to make things look very pretty very quickly, which is, is, is handy. And, and just to come back, uh, update on Susan, um, go wild with an eye, you're, you cut a break because it's, it's uh, getting a host error. <laughs> so so we, we don't know exactly where it goes, but. Oh, okay. We'll see. Yeah. Yes. All right, any final questions or comments? Success stories, horror stories? That's not this panel. Great, well, I just wanna reiterate from the IMLS perspective of, of the multiple um, audiences that these folks are thinking about when they're promoting their programming. Um, and if it is an IMLS funded program, and I understand uh, what Evan said about, about promoting the state funded stuff. Um, but if it is an IMLS funded program, you can use IMLS funds to promote it. Um, that's part of, of what makes a program successful. Um, and I know that that can, that line can get a little gray sometimes. So if you do have questions about, oh, if we do this, can we use IMLS funds for it? Feel free to ask your program officer and we will help you with that. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs>